There is nothing, and I, I put in this my reputation as scientist, there is nothing which can replace the silicon chip. Transistors are in chips and chips are in everything. They're from your mobile phone, your iPod, your washing machine, your fridge, even shoes now. I mean, silicon chips are in literally everything. And the industry is really starting to run up against some fundamental limits of matter, the universe as it were. Professor Asen Asanov and his team in the Nano CMOS project are investigating transistors, or what they call devices, in order to discover how they will be used in chips. Now that these devices are so small, the team is dealing with the variability of individual atoms. Initially, this problem was mainly of academic interest, and uh, the industry wasn't paying too much attention, but uh, with the introduction of uh, modern technology generation, particularly scaling of transistors below 100 nanometer device dimensions, the issues associated with variability in the corresponding transistor characteristics uh, become of tremendous importance for the semiconductor industry. And uh, the industry realized that uh, most of these problems cannot be tackled in purely technological level. This one in particular is a kind of an abstract look at what's going on inside a transistor. And what we can do is we can simulate that, get an IV curve, see what the performance is like, throw the dice again, get another set, do it again, do it again, do it again, and then you build up these ensembles, these collections, of characteristics that say, ah, this is how, on average, a device would work. The Nano CMOS project needed more computer power for a number of reasons, and this led Professor Asanov to consider e-science as a way of changing the parameters of his research. The, the simulations that Professor Asanov's running and, and his group are incredibly computationally intensive. They, they could fill every cluster in the UK easily, many times over. So high performance computing and easy access to this it was one thing that we wanted to do. We also identified that data management was a killer for them. So uh, um, they are generating huge amounts of data. And unlike in other disciplines where you might, there might be international standards on the way you describe data, there wasn't in electronics. So there isn't a common name for things and there is no sort of common way to describe describing things. And especially things like metadata. How do you describe enough information about an experiment so that somebody else can find it, access it, etc. Um, key as well as security. I mean, we're dealing with commercial data, sensitive data, which if it gets out, a lot of the electronic industry is based upon protection of intellectual property. There is no um, product other than intellectual property itself. If you have to say what does National Science Centre in Glasgow, the common denominator across all the projects that we're involved in is we do fine-grained security where people can collaborate in a secure way. The device modeling group which I lead at Glasgow uh, is doing uh, uh, the comprehensive physical uh, compute intensive simulations but uh, this is generating huge amount of data which we are sharing with uh, five other leading design groups in the UK. And the generation, uh, the annotation and the sharing of this data is really in the heart of the NanoCMOS project. Professor Asanov pretty much said the ideal grid for him would be where he can do exactly what he wants to do now, but have a minus G flag, as in now it's going to be going on the grid. So that was the model. One of the problems with many grid projects is that they try to, to revolutionise the, what these people do. I mean, Asen and his group, they're the world leaders. They are the best. They are heavily involved in so many different major projects with industry, and etc. And if I say to him, no, you have to do it this way now, it wouldn't work. He knows what works. He knows how to write these codes. That these guys are expert in physics, in writing, high, they know more high-performance computing than anybody. If that's the model, we have to give them software which fits that model. And I think right now we, we, we're pretty much getting there. It's allowing us to do things on a larger scale. It means we can turn around the research quicker. Uh, and that's a very important thing, especially when you're working in semiconductors, because it changes so quickly that if it takes us two years to do research, that research is usually out of date. So it's actually very important to be able to turn around the results quickly. And that's what the science gives us the technology to do. Well, I mean, it's, it's greatly reduced the complexity of the amount of stuff that I need to do um, before we got involved. 
just running an ensemble of devices, like a collection of, of devices, it was a lot of work. I mean, uh, copying data, putting it into um, clusters, running it, checking results, checking how things worked out, finding failed devices was a lot of work. And I can spend more of my time looking at results and, and, and try to figure out how these things affect us and not spend all of my time just running things and checking things and finding out that simulation is broken. We reach a couple of milestones already. Uh, the first milestone we develop, and I, it's not, not very good for me to say this, but we, we, we develop the best technology available in this world for physical simulation of variability of small devices. Ten years ago, they wouldn't believe any of it. Suddenly now, yeah, suddenly now it assens everybody's buddy. <laughs> <laughs>